did we have a little snafu today? Well, I did. So I'm on the ICA webinar, getting ready to go. Alice is, is introducing me. And then all of a sudden, my screen goes black, black. So the first thing I think of, oh, heck, uh, my battery's dead. So I ran to get the cord. No, it wasn't my battery. I could not get my computer back up. It's dead. The computer, my little Mac, is only two years old, and that should not have happened. So needless to say, I could not do the webinar. So I'm doing it now. I'm recording it. So I want to welcome everyone, and I want to thank you for attending. You know, this was supposed to be an interactive workshop, which means participation. And I wanted to encourage people having questions, but that's not the case. So I'm on my own and you're gonna have to bear with me. Okay. All right, guys, we're here. We are here. We've made it through the most difficult time that our industry has seen since the Great Depression. Truly, the industry was brought to its knees. But we see the light. You know, now is the time for rebuilding and restructuring our sales team, right? Because an effective profit driving sales team is more important now than ever before. And with most companies in dire need of recouping the losses from 2020. So I'm congratulating each and every one of you. You're still in business. And that's a huge accomplishment, huge. You know, unfortunately, I've had to work with many caterers in assisting them to close their business or even merge with another company. It was not fun. It was really hard to see these really wonderful companies get into a position like this. So kudos to you. All right, part one, we did discuss some different things and that was in September. So you can go back to the archives of the ICA and um, see if you can find that. It was regroup, refocus and rebuild. So in part one, we did discuss the state of the industry and we talked about that we're, we're seeing the industry is slowly recovering from this crisis. And our goal is to try and analyze and predict which of these changes may be permanent and which are short lived. You know, this pandemic has created defining moments for sales. You know, customers, they're demanding that companies view them as more than just potential revenue. There has been a shift. You know, in building a motivated team that actually prospects and sells the brand will be the single most important factor of success for 2022 and beyond. You know, this is a perfect time for a fresh start, new concepts, new procedures, and new accountability. You know, the success of a catering company is in the sales team. Managers need to be hyper focused on the development of the team, right? We also discussed setting sales goals. One of my favorite topics. You know, salespeople, they thrive on structure. They want to know what's expected of them and how they can make more money and to make sure it is a fair system, right? So it's likely you'll need to reevaluate the team sales goals and introduce new tools and techniques and strategies to get them on the right path. Yeah? Okay. We need to transform to perform. You know, the struggle to make sales goals the best they can be and continue is what every, every company faces. So developing a plan for sales growth and ongoing activity can improve your sales and, and sanity because the importance of individual sales goals, and I know I keep going over this and over this and over this, but the importance of individual sales goals gives your salespeople personalized attention so they can perform at their peak. They're achieving sales revenue goals. It's for your business. And, and you know, one of the biggest challenges that I think every owner faces is achieving sales revenue. <clears throat> so it's time to restructure the compensation package because right now we, they don't have sales to count on. So you either have to do the hourly, 
salary, salary with commission, all commission, which I don't really suggest right now, and draw. Okay, so you know what hourly and salary is, you know what salary with commission is, but all commission is just that all commission as when they finish executing the event and it is all paid, then the salesperson gets paid. There is the draw, which I prefer, yet I do believe that draws have to be restructured in today's climate because they don't have all these sales to be ba banking, especially if they're a social caterer. So a draw would mean, okay, I believe because we went through your goals that you will do 800,000 in sales for 2022, okay? So now we're really looking for 2022. <clears throat> so I say to the salesperson, all right, $800,000. Um, $800, and in using the 10% method, now salespeople by percentage, industry standards anywhere between seven and um, 10%, right? And it really depends on what kind of benefits you're giving them. Are you paying for their phone? Are you paying for insurance? Are you paying for, you know, whatever. Um, but <clears throat> if you're, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I have a frog. <clears throat> so if you're paying for any of these things, if you're not paying for, let's just use the 10% just to make it easier. So I say to my salesperson, okay, we've come up with your sales goals. We did it together and we've come up with $800,000. And using the 10% structure, I would say to them, okay, so that means that you are going to be paid $80,000. And I'm gonna take this $80,000 and I'm gonna divide it into 12 months. And that is your draw, your, your paycheck basically. Now, as you approach your 800,000, then what happens is you continue to get a draw and then 10% more kicks in after you hit the 800,000. So they can see this and they get very excited because they're making a lot of money. My theory is salespeople should get paid for what they sell. And I'm telling you, once they see that their upselling is going to be higher, they're going to be pushing higher product. They're not going to be saying, oh, let me see if I can get the price down for you. It's not going to happen, right? Okay, so that is the uh, commission. All right, one of the things that I thought was very, very interesting is I had the opportunity to, to poll 778 event professionals all across the country. And one of the questions I asked them is, is there a formal contract between a salesperson and the company? And 62% said no. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're not protecting our employee. We're not protecting ourselves. Sales contracts or contracts are so, so important. So important. And they're very easy to do. You really only need to do six major departments. You need it at will. You need job responsibility. You need work hours, your salary slash commissions, job um, confidentiality information and benefits. That's it, but it has to be signed and it could be reevaluated in six months, however you want to set it up, but it really does protect you and it protects your employees. All right, so these are my favorite trends. Every time I speak, I always want to find something out there that helps catering companies do their jobs. And I remember about five or six years ago, I met, um, and you guys probably all know them now, Tripp and uh, Clint from SV Value at a NACE meeting, a NACE experience. And it was about six years ago. And I remember them saying that they had this food purchasing program. And I was like, mm, you know, because I remember Andy saying to me, yeah, these food purchasing programs don't work because they give you low prices on certain things, but then they jabs you you know, way up on other things. So I was very polite and I said, well, thank you very much. And I took the literature. I came home from the conference and I put it on the breakfast bar. Didn't think anything of it. And a couple of days later, Andy says to me, 
what is um, this food purchasing program? I said, what do you mean? It's, it's SB Value. And, and these, I met these guys at NACE. And he says, well, this one's a little different. So needless to say, Andy, who was just very a stickler on a lot of stuff, we're doing their food purchasing program and we're saving 19%. That goes right to the bottom line. Holy cow. All right. So that is, and then I got him involved with the ICA and I, I knew that they were going to be able to help our ICA members. And so many of you guys are using them. And I love this kind of, of saving money all around. Now I'm saving 19%. Well, I found something else. And this one is huge because we all are, we all are trying to get reviews or trying to get rid of bad reviews or whatever it is, but reviews are really, really important. And this company, actually, I know Josh because he was a client of mine because he was a caterer. And now he works for this company, which is so cool. You guys, it. I, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna have him come and explain it. We're doing it. We're using it now, and I absolutely love it. So we're gonna have a back and forth conversation. And here you go. I'm gonna press the button right now. You ready? I'm ready. Hi, Josh. Hey, Meryl. Thanks for coming. I told I told these guys about your your product, and as you're out of the catering business, yay! <laughs> but um. You got to tell them about this because I truly believe that this is something special. And I was telling him earlier how I try to find my favorite things. And this is a game changer. So you got to tell them what it is. Tell them. Okay. Uh, I'm the same way. I actually, I was in catering for 15 years and I sold my company two years ago and I was then basically looking for the next thing. And I was playing a lot of golf during COVID and a guy I was playing golf with turned out to be a consultant to this company, Bird Eye. And he was working with the COO and working with them on sales. And he was telling me all about it. And I found out that this company is the solution for reputation-based companies, specifically people in hospitality, people in catering, people with venues, photographers, anybody who's selling their business based on reputation will immediately understand why this company is a solution for them. And right now, what we were talking about a few minutes ago, Meryl told me is we're talking about reviews, how important they are, and how they really are the force that drives people to purchase and then repurchase services from reputation-based companies. Yeah. So before I talk any more about it. Okay, I wanted to just, because I, when I'm on, I always look at reviews, you know, my daughter taught me, and that is the age was, is on this internet all the time, that she doesn't go anywhere without a, a four plus, four plus rating. And she's saying everybody's using reviews. So, but there are these ad reviews, like I never look at those. I just scroll down to the real reviews. Right. Why should, why should you read someone's paid ad right, just because right. they, they have enough money to put it up on top right you want to you want to have authentic social proof which is the term we use mm -hmm. that something is good and, and and so i mean we all know about popeye's fried chicken sandwich right people were shooting each other in parking lots over that thing because their facebook told them they must go have it wow so i, I have i have a little video that i share with meryl that she's gonna share with you um, that I think will just kind of illustrate what we're talking about. Okay, I'm gonna put it on right now. Okay. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little,
He looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. Oh my God, that, Josh, that was so funny. <laughs> That's hysterical. Right, and it stands up. I mean, it's still grainy black and white, but it shows you exactly what we already know, mm -hmm. which is that if you go outside uh, you know, a building in downtown uh, in the middle of the day and you start staring up at the sky, within about a minute, you're gonna have 10 other people standing next to you staring up at the sky. And so it's the same thing with reviews that really, you know, if somebody's shopping for a wedding, they don't want to see one review that you've had from a wedding three years ago. They want to see 25 reviews up until even a month or two weeks ago of you consistently doing great weddings. And having all those there is going to drive people to you right away. They're going to already, they're going to want to purchase before you've even pitched to them about what you can do. Yeah, I, I love it. Okay, so... There's so many like bells and whistles with this program and, and we just started with it and we're loving it because we get alerted all the time and we see somebody even sent us a message. I don't know how that worked, but somebody sent us a message not to forget something for their event through bird eye. So I, I so it is, I, I know that my team has gone through all the bells and whistles. I looked at some of them, but there was one thing that that was really interesting something about like google what if, what does google do google rates you high well, tell me tell me <laughs> sure so you know when you go to search on google right you get a if, if you're on your phone you're going to get a, a little three pack with like three different right. companies near you near you if you're on your laptop or your, or your pc you'll get a page that shows 10 businesses sometimes the top three alone and they're gonna be rated and they're gonna be what we call, we call it indexing. And indexing is really crucial. So if you wanna be found, you need to be on that first page. The, the place that, 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 that catering companies go to die is the second page of Google. So what really needs to happen is you need to find a way to get you on that first page because People my age, we may search two or three pages and go on for you know as much even five minutes. But if you're under 40 right now, you're spending no more than a minute on your search and you're going to the top people on your Google search and you're gonna engage with them first. So our goal at BirdEye is how do we get you up to the top of that index? And we have a lot of great tools to do it, but the most important thing to know is that we are the only approved and vetted, trusted partner with Google in reputation management. That's what there I'm many, huge. There are many other companies that may claim it, but that's not the case. And Bert, I can prove it. And essentially that if you want to put a review up on Google through BirdEye, it doesn't need to be approved by Google. Google's already approved it. It goes right up. If you want to put up a review 
on Google on your own, there's about 12 to 14 steps that you have to take. You got to sign into your account. You got to find the business. You got to you got to rate the business. You got to put a geolocate. There's like a long list. And then it could take two weeks for that review to go up because Google is going to go ahead and vet it to make sure it's authentic. So go through bird on. If you already assumed. All right. So the, the way I understand it is that we have these links that we get, and it's done by text. Um, God, there's so many bells and whistles. So it's so let's, if let's, I, not, let's not focus on all the bells and whistles. Let's I love focus them on all. I, love I know. Them. Let's talk about reviews. Okay. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about listings and reviews, okay, which okay, are the most okay. important. Yes. All right. So what do you mean listings? Listings are your name, address, and phone number. And how does Bird Eye help with that? Well, we make sure that it's the same on all of your different listings across all the different search engines. Okay. So if there's one, if there's one digit out of place, if there's one, if you have different, if you have say Merrill Snow Catering and on one and Merrill Snow Events or Merrill Snow Catering and Events on another, that's three different listings. That's inconsistency that would push you down in the index. Oh. So BirdEye is going to fix your listings and make sure it's consistent on all the search engines. And they do it every day automatically. And if you, we find something, you can manually fix it, but we're going to automatically fix it every day. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right. So tell me what else you want to say about it, because I have lots to say, and, you, and these are the bells and whistles. So you don't want me to say those things, but I got to tell you, those bells and whistles are pretty damn cool. Right. Well, I think... The first thing I want to talk about is its affordability and its usability. Okay. Because the first thing that I would ask as a caterer is, okay, how much? Mm -hmm. Because I'm working month to month. I need to know whether this is even something. And I, that's a great question. And I will happily share pricing with you and with other people. But really the question is, how much money are you leaving on the table by not having good reviews and accurate listings? How much money is out there that is not coming to you that could come to you very easily if you use this tool. Yeah. And so if we figure out, you know, basically what your problems are and we fix them, we could see revenue go up. And this is a conservative estimate, eight to 10%. That's and this is consistent. And it's consistent across 60,000 of our present clients who are using BirdEye and are staying with BirdEye at 100% retention rate. Once they start with us, they don't leave. And most of them start with reviews and listings. And then they think, oh, you know what? Actually, these bells, other bells and whistles, because BirdEye has a bunch of other tools. Let's start adding some of those on and seeing how much more we can make. And so that's when that comes into play. I got you. I got you. So, all right, let's talk about bad reviews because that's, that's an elephant. And I know you don't get rid of them, but what do you do? So if you have bad reviews that you've had from Yelp and they're up on Google, the only way to get rid of those bad reviews is to push them down and to get more reviews on top of them so they're lower down. The other thing to know is that having bad reviews is not necessarily bad. Right. It shows that you're authentic. If you go to some listing and you see that they're all five stars and they have zero bad reviews, I my eyebrows go up a little higher than they are now. Mm -hmm. I would say wait a second, nobody's perfect and nobody ever has made it through, you know, this number of years of business without something going wrong. So we don't want to eliminate bad reviews. We can't do that. But one thing that BirdEye does do is we give you a platform that allows people to review you through that platform to Google. And if they have a negative review, there's an opportunity for that person to give you that feedback directly before they put it up onto Google. That's and it's not, it's not gating. It's not stopping that review. They can still do it, but it gives you the opportunity to be accountable. And if you're like me, when I got a bad review, when I was doing running my company, I used to like stay up at night. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep because yeah. I all I thought to myself is if I just had the opportunity to address this with this person. I know that they wouldn't have reviewed this. And you can do that prior to it actually getting listed. That's a huge. Exactly. That's huge. Exactly. And if they haven't even written the review yet. They've just clicked on a button that said that they didn't have a perfect experience. Mm -hmm. And that's going to come to you immediately. Yeah, that's, and that's something. Because you know, it comes right to my phone. It comes right to my phone. 
And, and how is that? It's great. <laughs> it's great. Right, because it, our worst fear is that we've done this perfect event, we go home, everybody thought it was perfect, then all of a sudden there's right. a negative review the next right. day. That's when you're just like, what? Everything was perfect. Yeah. So here there's an opportunity that you may even, and also the other one is, look, you, you had, you had the, the, the mother of the bride come up to you and trash you at the end of the wedding. Right, she's drunk and she's upset and she's emotional and everything, right? You can then make sure that she gets a request for a review right away. And you can even say, look, I know it wasn't perfect. Can we please get your feedback? So that she feels heard. She wakes up the next day, oh, I, you know, it wasn't that bad. She doesn't trash you that night, you know, from her okay. hotel room. And you've, you've stopped something from happening that could cost you, I mean, look, if, if you have negative reviews up on your thing, if you have less than four and a half stars, people are moving on. If you have under four stars, they're not even looking. So we need to get you up to at least four and a half stars. And it's very doable. The other thing is, and and I think I was talking to you or one of your guys that, that, that set this up for us, which were great, is that there's so many companies that don't bother to ask for reviews or, or, or they ask them. And I know a lot of my clients, they'll ask, and we used to do it the same thing. We had every link there was to the Knot, Wedding Wire, Google, Yelp, and we'd send it to them and say, we'd love for you to give us a review. And they, and they always write back, oh, I sure will, but they never do. What I liked about BirdEye is that it's a, it's a direct text right to them, right? And it, it makes it so much easier because I know since we were using it for like a week, we just kept getting these reviews coming in. It's like, oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that what you're saying is that because we get, we're getting everywhere right now, we're getting peppered for requests for yeah. our information. Yeah. Everywhere we go, yeah. everything we do. And so this is a very polite, convenient, and also appropriate way to get reviews hounding people for reviews, offering to give them gift cards if they give you a good review, all those things. Google picks up on that and you get ding. It's a big no-no. And it's also not a good way to represent yourself. Really what we want to do is just make it easy so that you can get to your satisfied clients right away and get, if you, let's say you have a, an event where there are 50 people there and 40 of them get the request and you get three reviews from that, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. more than enough. Yeah, that's great. I love it. I love it. So, um, and I know you can tell how excited I am about this program because I love anything that helps us, our, our people, because <laughs> we need every, we need all the help we can get. Um, so how do they, how do, I know you are an ICA uh, vendor member, but how can they get in touch with, how do they find out more information? Okay, so um, I'm going to make sure that um, you have all my, uh, my okay. email address. Yeah. And um, they can they can go to birdeye.com okay. and they can wa watch the demo there. They're, they're going to get somebody will reach out to them other than me. So it might be I, I have some kind of industry specific pricing available that you won't get if you go right to the website. So I think it makes sense to kind of come to me and then we can talk yeah. about whether it's even a fit because, you know, look, if you're if you're already super, super busy and making more money than you need to and you don't want more business then this is not the answer for you, you know? So I don't want you, I don't want you to get this, but if you're thinking of, you know, it's scalable. So if you're thinking of opening another location or, you know, trying to budget next year and to project, um, I think that this is a solution for you. Um, so yeah, and then I'll, I'll just give you all my contact information, Marilyn. You um, you're it. making it sound like it's a lot of money. You guys, it's not a lot of money. You're making it sound that way, Josh. <laughs> it's not, it's affordable. It's not. Not, I don't want to get into the, I don't want to get into the pricing today. And I know there's different but levels, can, right. Levels, but I can, I can say that it's not going to cost you $10,000 no. a year for no guarantee of anything coming back, which a lot of search engine optimization requests are. I mean, they're asking you to give you a lot of, this is very much like it proves itself quickly and people want to keep it. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's the goal of this tool. Yeah, I love it. All right, Josh, thank you. I'm going to um, get your email right on, on your little face over there. 
and so they can um, connect with you. If you guys have any questions, you know, it's, it's great to talk to Josh because Josh is one of us, so he gets it. So thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. And I will talk to you later. Mwah. All right, bye-bye. Complacency meaning. A feeling of satisfaction with your own abilities or situation that prevents you from trying harder. Hmm. It's just a job. We've got to get our employees by thinking it's just a job, right? Part of keeping your team motivated is ensuring that they don't become complacent. You know, even the best salespeople can become complacent over time. I mean, long-term relationships with your sales team is one of the most important things a leader can do. So replace transactional with transformational for a successful, motivated team. So according to Dale Carnegie, companies who employees are well engaged to outperform their competitors by over 200%. Right. Employee engagement is not possible without employee training. It follows that having a good employee training manual in place can help boost your company's ability to engage in its employees. So what makes people complacent? Think about it. I know you know, right? Okay. Well, boredom, wrong career choice, no training, no motivation, they're disengaged, they lost their drive, they take shortcuts, they don't take risks, they lost their passion, and they stop taking initiative, right? So you have a great hire. They were wonderful for a year. And then all of a sudden, you see these things happening. Why is that? Well, I got to tell you guys, a fish rots from the head. You know what that means? That means, I know you know what it means. Leaders, leaders need to lead. And if you had a very engaged employee and all of a sudden things are changing, something is happening, right? Because no one rises to low expectations. A players want to step up and not level out. So why do good people become complacent? Well, there's favoritism, lack of praise, no training, no accountability. They're not consistent, no coaching or education. Things aren't fair, takes credit for employees' work, focus on weaknesses, not strengths, and micromanage. Any of these things can make an employee complacent, a good employee complacent. You know, there is work-life balance. It's still a thing, right? And I think the millennials did a fabulous job for especially my generation in noting that there is life after work. My generation, we worked our butts off and we worked into the night and this generation saying, no, I want a life. So it is a work-life balance. And if you're over 40 years old, you've got to understand this in the millennials or the younger people that are coming up. Okay. So they just need five incentives, five flexibility. They need to have flexible time off and time off and they need good technology. They need to be challenged for growth and they need appreciation and acknowledgement. That's it. So how do you recognize a toxic employee? Gossip, judgment, negativity, complaining, excuses, exaggeration, lying, facts, opinions, and low productivity, right? 
I want to show you this movie clip, and there's something very, very powerful at the end. Here you go. Whoa. What's going on, Mr. Voss? Biology, Derek. Fair enough. Can someone tell me what happens when a cell stagnates? Okay, no one's listening to me. I will try again. Anyone know what happens to a stagnant cell? What's he doing on the table? I don't know, something about cells. Malia. It's not good. Did you hear that? It ain't good. People, a cell that is not in motion is not a productive member of the system. It ends up assuming all the other cells are gonna pick up the slack somewhere, but they don't. In fact, they imitate the stray cell until basically the whole organism begins to die. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what, biology is an amazing thing. And here's the good news, all that decays can be restored. It's just hitting anybody. Like how a cut heals. Like how a cut heals. Brian, my man. Oh, well, you got one. <laughs> and once that cell is back on track, it creates energy amongst the other cells. That's what happens. It starts getting a little movement going. It gets a little rumble. Can I get a little rumble from everybody? Everybody just rumble in your seats right now for me. Just rumble a little bit. Okay, no rumble, that's fine. I'll be the lone rumbler up here. That's what I am. I'm a lone rumbler. But then the cell starts banging into the other cells. And the cells push back and go, hey, what are you doing to me? They hit him to another one. Hey, don't do that to me. That's my friend. You don't even know him. You don't know me either. I know you. We work together. Because then they hit a rhythm. All hit a rhythm and this is the beginning of the restorative process so now even if the entire system is close to dead what happens martinez come on give me something oh no not today oh no not in my house no 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 look out here we come don't look up my pant leg derek you're better than that I'm right over you come on man what do you say if all the cells work together, what will happen? The entire system is healed. Exactly. That is a sick dragon. Yeah! If all cells work together, the system is closed. That means it's a tight, tight system, but everybody has to work together. And it's our job as managers to make this team cohesive, right? So how do we manage toxic employees? We got to dig deeper. If we find that somebody is, it was great one time and then all of a sudden it's just doing all the things that we don't want, they're disengaged or they're being a troublemaker or whatever. We've got to dig deeper. We've got to find out what the issue is, right? We need to give them direct feedback. You also want to document everything. Plus you want to separate the toxic people away from the other people. So if you have an office that you're able to do that, move things around, see what happens. You also want to design an action plan for this. You want to establish pattern of behavior. Maybe it's always when one person's there, or maybe it is a personal life. We don't know what's happening. We've got to dig deeper, right? We have to make the employee a part of the solution. So when you call them in to talk about it and you say, you know, they may admit it and say, what shall we do about it? What do you think that, that, would make things work. Let them be part of the solution. Then you have to explain the consequences. If this continues, then what, right? You also have to accept that some people won't change and you have to know when to let them go. I don't know who Dave Curlin is, but he said it quite well. 
He said, employees resign when income, culture, degree of difficulty, or management practices are not to the salesperson's liking. Involuntary turnover occurs less often because most sales managers are too patient, they accept mediocrity, and avoid confrontation, especially a potentially uncomfortable termination. This is so true. And all across the country, I see this. I see bad eggs. I see non-performers. I, and I say to the manager, why are they still here? Uh, I haven't gotten around to it. Or I thought they would change. And I think this is their, their year. And we've got to get rid of bad blood or, or people that don't perform. And it's very, very difficult for managers to do that. I get it. I get it. All right, so does this look familiar to you? You're responsible for all this stuff. The policies and procedures, the client meetings, the closings, the qualifying, the proposals, the training the sales team and retraining and retraining and setting and tracking goals and employee reviews. There's not enough you. It's exhausting and inconsistent. But what we need to do is we need to put more onus on the salespeople. So wouldn't this be better? It Moving this away allows you the time you need to run the business. You need to train them. And first of all, you have to hire and hire a really good, good person. And that is just not easy to do. Then you have to think about the compensation plans and then the employee contract and then the sales training itself and sales techniques and sales scripts, and then you have to test them. Then there's policies and procedures and the templates and proposals and sales meeting incentives and goal setting and accountability, and then you have to track it. So it is really, really important of structuring a sales team instead of just like, here you go, figure it out. We're, you know, these are our menus. You know, so if you do this, you're setting yourself up for more revenue faster. Trust. All right. So we're moving on to, I can't tell you how important the training manual is. I mean, I, I swear by it. Well, first of all, I can't stand being asked questions more than once. And with the turnover of staff, you need to have a training manual because you go, here it is, study it. Now, mind you that a training manual is a living document because it keeps needing to be updated as things change. But creating a quality training manual for various positions in your company, not only for sales, but I strongly believe it for sales, is an important part of the organization's talent management plan. I mean, when training manuals are available for key positions in the company, it is possible to ensure continuity of the operations. And when new employees are hired, and it sure does stop the questions, how do I do these questions? Um, and I just say, go to the training manual. So taking time to write out an employee training manual may seem like a laborious task. I know, I know. However, a formal training manual ensures consistency in the presentation of the training program. You know, another major advantage is that all training information on skills, processes, and other information necessary to perform the test is all together in one place, right? So I am a strong, strong believer in training. And I think that if we don't have our people trained, then it's just, we're just going to constantly be a, a revolving door of training. I mean, there's nothing worse. And I know it happens that we bring in new salespeople and we say, just listen to the office, sit and listen, or, and here's the computer system, try and figure it out or follow her or taking time away from a, another sales producer to train the other ones. So this is why I truly believe in training manuals. Now, 
so there's there's several different things that a, a manager needs to do in order to really run a tight sales team. Oh, sales meetings. I love sales meetings. Your sales meetings in four acts. So you can break down your meeting into four 15-minute blocks that will work well for everyone and keep the meeting moving and make it productive and try and set it up like this. Don't start off your sales meeting on a down note. You want to make the meeting positive experience. So use the first 15 minutes as a way to praise everyone for the numbers they had during the past week. Congratulate individuals for hitting and exceeding particular sales goals. You know, don't make a big deal of the people that did not hit them. They know who they are. Plus, their numbers are on the board. You know, it, it, so make a big deal out of the ones that hit the goal because it is a big deal. You know, a round of applause from the group is a great thing for motivation. I mean, you could even use this time to do something like hand out gift cards as recognition or for great work, or for those that may have missed their goals last week, now is not the time for chastising or reprimands, right? They know they missed the mark. They do. They already know that. And with the right motivation, maybe they'll strive to do better. All right, the next one is education. <clears throat> Your sales meeting is a great teaching moment. So you don't let it slip by. You know, take 15 minutes to go over different sales techniques that can be effective and do some role playing so that the, the sales force can see how to work with different clients and situations and talk about how to build solid relationships and make a, to make a proposal or teach the best way to work on closing a deal. I mean, the information learned here can be a big help to your team. One of the ways that we do that is with our box. And it's basically called clients say the damnedest things. And in this box, there is index cards we put in there. Then we, they write down their challenges. And it could be, I don't, um, I stumble uh, when I'm talking about the production fee or whatever question it is, whatever they're stumbling on or they're unsure about, they put it into the challenges. And then um, there's a spot that says, clients say the damnedest things about, you know, how to address something when a client says this or whatever. So we use this time uh, this education time for this and somebody will pull up something out and we will review it and it's amazing to see that the junior salespeople have a different take than the the senior salespeople and then as a company as a unit we say okay this is our policy on this question okay so now we're all saying the same thing which is pretty important all right let's go to the sales board this is pretty, pretty cool. All right. We are an open book company. And in this, you see all of the, um, the teams that we have. These are the different colors. I it, know it, it's very difficult to see this. Oh, I think I have one close up. Oh, I do. Okay. So let's take Dan. His goal, remember we did the goals before, in this month, I'm not sure what month, month this is, was $220,000. And at the point that this picture was taken, he had $212,000 booked, I mean, um, executed in this month. He, his variance is $7,200. Now, we do this for the whole month, but this picture could have been taken week three. So then he knows that he's only $7,248 away from goal. And to a salesperson in a week, you can change a lot. You can, you can um, take small little house party that comes in, or you can upsell, or, you know, you could do a lot of different things. And when they see this number that, oh, I'm so close to this, it's not the, the it's the, 
the idea of hitting goal. It's the idea of showing their peers a hit goal. It's not always motivated by money because salespeople have a natural, healthy competition. Sometimes not so healthy, but you can, you can figure that out. All right. So then uh, amongst this, he had 11 inquiries, four meetings, eight proposals went out, four samplings, looks like zero or one call, that means a call out to call a corporate client and two bookings, okay? So that is how that's done. Now this is, now you could see, I don't know who this one is above, um, they're probably a junior salesperson because their goal was $80,000. Look, they were $79,000 um, that they have and they're only $540, away from goal. To them, this is like huge. All they do is upsell or whatever it is. So they are so close to goal, right? It's great to see this. Okay. So then the next one is opportunity. So what I mean by opportunity, salespeople are not just order takers. Mm -mm -mm. They have to keep their eyes open, their ears open, and they have to bring something to the table, right? So one of the things that I, uh, I like to insist that everybody does is they have to watch 30 minutes of local news at, each day and 30 minutes of national news because they have to know what's happening in the world. I, I used to have them read the newspaper, but you know, with, they're getting the news somehow on their phones, however, so I don't uh, require that. But they have to know what's going on for several reasons. The first one being, they have to be well-rounded when they're talking to clients that they know if something big happened, they can, they can add to the conversation. And the second reason is, especially the local news, they could see, you know, what is happening in their area. They, they talk, they're looking at the society page, they're looking wherever it is, or somebody died, or a company got a big award, whatever it is. This is information that is really good for a salesperson. So the opportunity they bring to the table, it could be I'm the salesperson and I am driving to work and I see that the Mercedes dealer is reno uh, renovating. So I'm thinking I'm coming to the sales meeting with this and I'm gonna say, uh, it's, when it's my turn for the opportunity. I'll say the Devin um, Mercedes is renovating and I'm gonna go after their their, um, <laughs> I'm going to go after their open house, right? Okay, so this goes, everybody goes around the table, be one time and only one time that somebody does not bring something to do it because we don't chastise them or anything like that. We're just going around the table and how embarrassing for them to say, I got nothing. Now, mind you that sometimes right before a meeting, I see a lot of people on their computers looking up different things so they can bring it to the table. But that's okay with me because they have to follow through on that, right? All right, then the next one is the big takeaway. All right, so, so often that you go to a meeting, a lot is said, a lot of stuff is written down, lots of notes, and then a week later, it's all forgotten or nobody's done anything about it. So the big takeaway is that we go around the table and each person has to say what they took away from that meeting we just had. However, the caveat is that they can't repeat anybody else's. So they're going to tell, they're gonna say what's top of mind to them that it was really important. And what will happen is somebody else that's sitting next to them will say, oh, I forgot about that and write that down. It just kind of makes it penetrate a little bit more. Right. So I love competitions. They're so much fun. So by setting up competitions and monetary incentives it intended to encourage everyone, they are, to get back on board and do their very best. And it's good for team spirit. So I like having these, these type of competitions. And this particular one is for the event producers and it's the February sales contest is Upgrade Linens. So in our collections, we have linens that are included. Well, that's the typical poly spun. But once we're in the planning process, we want to upgrade their linens. So they will do that. And then as they do that, they get credit for it. And then the winner gets a prize. So that's always fun. Now, 
I used to do just gift certificates or a hundred dollars or something like that. And it wasn't fun anymore. It was kind of like expect it. Well, here's your gift card. So I changed it up on them. So I said to them, all right, here's some index cards. I want you guys to write down what you think that would be a good prize when you either hit your goal or you win the contest. I said, put, put anything you want. Oh, I knew when I said put anything you want that I'm, I'm um, really opening that up to everything. Um, however, I also knew that I was reading them and I could pull out the ones that I don't want. But I was pleasantly surprised when I saw what they wanted. So I'm going to show you this little video clip of one of our sales meetings. It's kind of cute. Doug hit it twice. You get two? You get two. Okay. But uh, don't look. Close your eyes. Down with him. Okay, up, where's up, the bolt? Where's the bolt and barrel? Just one. Okay. Okay, now open it up. Yeah. Leave work at 12 p.m. and finish day from home. <laughs> So what's really cool about this is that they all got really, really excited, but nobody, nobody put anything outrageous in there. It was like a day off, come in at 12, Manny Petty, tickets to the Phillies game. They were just like little nothing things, which was great. And they really enjoyed it. They had fun and we just make it a lot of fun. All right. So here are your tips on this. All right. You want to have the sales meeting the same day every week and pick a day that you know that is not going to ch change all the time. So we've chosen Tuesdays at 10 o'clock, which worked out well for us. So the salespeople know every single Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a sales meeting. So they don't schedule anything around that. I promise them that it will stay to one hour. And it truly is a sales meeting, not a company meeting, not an operations meeting, not a culinary meeting. It is just the salespeople, okay? And, and so we want to make sure that they're getting a benefit out of this. It has to be the same time every day or every week, okay? So you set the tone of it. And you're the one is like their cheerleader and you're excited because if you go into this, this meeting and say, you know, talk about what a sucky weekend they had, or, you know, somebody was complaining, or I didn't get this, or the kitchen did this, that you, you're railroading yourself. It's got to be a positive. This is not, we're not talking about past things at these meetings. That can be done separately and one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but this is all education in helping the salespeople move forward. You want to keep it to one hour. And sometimes what I will do is if I have a, um, let's say a, a buffet tablescape that I want to show them or something that's a little bit more than the time allowed, I would either borrow from the other time slots or I will extend the meeting a half an hour and I will give them two weeks notice for that. So I will write the meeting, um, Tuesday sales meeting, 
will go from 10 to 11.30 on this date. So they know they can adjust their, um, their times. So things come up, right? And then something may come up on Tuesday at 10 o'clock and it's all hands on deck or most of the people can't be there. Well, the sales, the sales meeting can't happen then, but it must happen within that week. And the salespeople get together themselves and say, all right, when can we do this? Should we do it at night? Should we do it here? And you know, sometimes it's even Sunday mornings. This is how much they, they want and need the sales meetings. It's, it's, a, a, it's a jolt of energy. Um, oh. On a webinar, got to go. Oh, okay, bye. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So the other thing is we pass the pad. And instead of one person taking notes, they um, take turns taking notes. And what they do is they take all the notes for the, for the uh, meeting, then they type them up and then they send them to everybody and they have to acknowledge the receipt of this. And then they're printed and put into the book because it makes everyone accountable. All right. This is just a fun video for salespeople, but make sure you read the text on the bottom. Listen up, babies. Life's not fair. You get no say in the world you're born into. You don't decide your name. You don't decide where you come from. You don't decide if you have a place to call home or if your whole family has to leave the country. Yeah, it's messed up. You don't decide how the world judges a person like you. You don't decide how your story begins, but you do get to decide how it ends. Yes! accountability my favorite topic yes it is management i can't say all management but the, a lot of the companies i've been to let employees avoid accountability because they themselves dislike confrontation so how do you turn accountability into a positive experience too often, most of us experience accountability like a slap on the hand, you know, a result of something I forgot to do or I didn't do. You know, we need to shift accountability to your team. You know, a lot could be said about feeling like you own your work. If your employees don't feel empowered in your business, they'll become nothing more than passive order takers who drop more failures on you than successes. So a great leader is one that can delegate work, set expectations and setbacks and, and hold their team members accountable. It's your responsibility to create a culture where your employees know that they are equally responsible for their successes and failures. And, and once you do this, your team will be more engaged and you will have more time to actually grow your business. You know, a sales manager's job is to individually coach each member of his or her sales team, you know, to the fullest potential. So a one-on-one -on -one in depth sales tracking session should be done in person with 
each salesperson or team every week or every other week. You know, this conversation takes about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, and it's focused on their goals, their pipeline, the meetings and their proposals. It's also a way to address issues that a salesperson may be facing. I mean, this time it, it allows for I don't know. I think this time is just so practical. It's relevant skills from the conversations that can focus on questions that you have and a, and, and a lot of practice activities that can be done. I know I'm just going crazy over this because I'm, I'm just so, I'm tongue tied over this because I, I so strongly believe in this, that accountability is so important. It's just not accountability for you and your, your team. It is there. They want this. They want this structure. They want to see how well they're doing or if they need to be for that. So I think it's, it's important. We have lots of different forms for this I could show you. So a meeting that neglects to define what achievement looks like and the reasonable action steps expected to arrive is not a productive use of time. You know, by holding routine meetings, you'll have the ability to spot issues early on, like how much money is out on the street um, in proposals. And that is on the street tracking sheet that I showed you in, in part one. And how qualified is the event on a scale one to five? It, it, it may be showing me that in the on the street tracking sheet that there's a lot of non-booked events in here that they did not get. And that may be, they're maybe not qualifying the clients, right? Maybe we're doing proposals that we shouldn't be doing. And that eats up on the time. You know, where are they in the actual sales process with these clients that the, the proposals out on the street? And what's their definitive next steps? So this on the street tracking, go back to part one, because I think I spent some time on that and it was just really important. This is just what it looks like. And I'll give you a little minute to look it through. I just love it because it has, at a glance, it has their booking ratio, how much money they have out in sales. I mean, look, this is over $500,000 that they have out in the street. That's half of their goal. Thank you so much for staying with me. I appreciate it. I hope you didn't forward fast it. <laughs> Anyway, um, you may have some questions on this because I didn't wasn't able to open this up for discussion. So please email me and call me, whatever it is that you need, Meryl at MerylSnow.com, and I will answer your questions. You know, I could talk sales all day, and I feel very strongly that a business is not a business without a strong sales team. You know, a business can't stay alive without sales, right? So Put your time and effort into your sales team and it will pay off. Trust, it will pay off. All right, thank you so much for coming. I want to hear from all of you and um, I'd love to just chit chat. I could talk sales all day. All right, bye. Thank you, ICA, for having me. Sorry about the confusion. Bye, everybody.